All right, so you should get a little message on your screen telling you to record. I'm going to switch out um, my screens to share. So just give me a second to do that. So many screens. My computer is cho choosing this minute to be slow and lazy. Okay. All right, thank you for your patience. With that, all right. So for those of you that uh, know me or have maybe heard me talk before about bats, um, you know that I've been doing bat education for some time. And uh, this is just a few pictures of um, one of my favorite events that I've done in, in a while. This was in 2022. It was the first ever Ohio Bat Blitz that uh, we conducted in the state. So we uh, caught 97 different bats that night, seven different species. And it was some great collabor collaboration with uh, a lot of different partners around the state to make this event happen. And we are planning another one in 2024 in Northeastern Ohio. So stay tuned for more information on that. But before I was an educator, I was, um, I guess you could say I was a researcher. I was a grad student and I did research in uh, the forests of Southern Ohio. And I was assessing the impacts of harvesting on bat populations. And so what I was doing, I was looking at um, uh, bat populations in forests that were being harvested to regenerate oaks. So they were putting shelter wood harvests into these different spaces. And you can see a couple numbers of the trees that are going to be retained. And then this is a very old picture. So apolog I apologize for the graininess, but you can see um, how different that looks, you know, from before and after the harvest. And there was some mid-story reduction that went on before the harvest, but much more open space. And that will come into play later when we start talking about foraging habitat for bats. But I had the opportunity to use some different equipment. Um, some of that equipment has uh, become much more advanced now, like this bat detector that I'm showing you here. Also had the opportunity to uh, use mist nets to capture bats. Here you see the poles are being erected and then we stretch a very fine net between them bats get entangled and um, we collect them and process them, collect data. Here are a few pictures of the very first bats that I caught. This little guy is a uh, tricolored bat previously known as the Eastern Pipistrelle to those of us that work with bats. The pip was just a great little name for them. Um, they're one of the smallest bats in North America and in Ohio. This one was very chill which I'll admit gave me very misleading expectations for the rest of the bats that I would be removing from the net. And they were not nearly as calm and relaxed as this little tricolored bat. Uh, for example, this is a female red bat. And I don't think she closed her mouth the entire time I was collecting data on her. She was just waiting for a stray finger to get close. Speaking of stray fingers, there's a few things in these pictures that I want to point out that we don't do anymore. So first of all, unless you are protected, uh, you know, you have a pre pre-exposure rabies vaccine, you never want to touch bats without thick gloves on, like I am doing that picture. I have that, um, those shots, so I was safe. But always, if you have to handle that, nice thick gloves. Um, and then the other thing that you don't see in those pictures is Tyvex gloves or rubber gloves. So nowadays when we work with bats, when we handle them, we make sure that we have a clean pair of rubber gloves on for every single bat, a different pair for every bat that we handle. And that's to ensure that we're protecting the bats and we're not uh, spreading disease from bat to bat or potentially spread, spreading disease from bat to bat. So I did wanna point that out. These pictures are special to me because they're nostalgic and they're some of the first bats that I caught, but it's also a good opportunity to just share with you all how times have changed. And not just in the protocols we use to protect bats and keep them safe, but also in the, the species and the number of bats that we are catching. Um, for example, it was normal for me when I was mess netting back, this was in 2006 and 2007, to catch northern long-eared bats almost every time we went out. And that's something that rarely happens these days. 
And for that note, um, pips, we hardly catch those anymore either. Uh, that's a species that has been proposed to be listed as federally endangered. It's already state in endangered. And as we know, the northern long-eared bat is federally and state endangered. So I want to start the presentation off by shout, giving a shout out to our forest landowners out there. Thank you so much for all that you are already doing to support our wildlife, especially our bats. We know that the majority of forests in Ohio are privately owned. And so for those of you that own or manage forests, you really are playing such a critical role in um, the stewardship of our wildlife resources. And that does include those that are used by bats, of course. So my goal here today in this presentation is to share how forest management that works to improve the health and productivity of your woods can at the same time uh, maintain and enhance habitat for bats, which is a group of wildlife that let's be frank, can use a little help, a little extra support these days, but are very important to our ecosystems, our forest ecosystems, and our forest health. I think a lot of you probably know that bats eat insects. They're the number one predators of night flying insects. Bats have capitalized on a niche that affords them little to no competition for the food that they're looking for. And flight takes a lot of energy Maintaining body temperature when you're small with a lot of surface area requires a lot of energy. So bats need to eat a lot of food. And that um, it's this that makes them essentially the top predator of insect populations in many of the landscapes uh, that they're foraging in, including our forests. So all of our species here in Ohio are insectivores. That means they're feeding solely on insects as well as other arthropods including some that are pests. And you can see in green at the bottom of your screen, uh, Dodd and others uh, reported that Northern long-eared bats have been found to eat a number of forest pests, pests, tent caterpillars, leaf rollers, tires, and uh, borers, just for some examples. And this is nothing new, right? We as bat educators, bat biologists, we've been saying this for years, that they do a lot for us, uh, but it's been difficult to kind of share some of that quantitative evidence there's been a little bit of that on the ag side, but in the forest side, it's been very difficult to do that. So I'm excited to share this, this research with you um, because it does provide some of that quantitative data, at least a little window into it, on how bats are impacting our forests. This study took place, I'm just gonna open the chat in case I need to see something. This um, study took place in uh, central, South Central Indiana. It was conducted by Elizabeth Bilk and Joy O'Keefe, and they're both with the University of Illinois. And the study area was forests that had oak, hickory, and tulip poplar in the canopy. And they had conducted a mid-story and overstory thinning several years prior to allow and encourage oak and hickory regeneration on the forest floor. So what they essentially did is they built these exclusion devices that capped that kept bats out at night, and they wanted to determine the impacts that bats were having on insect defoliators. So every morning and every night, they would open and close the mesh sides of these structures, and that would allow birds daytime access, which is what you're seeing kind of on the far right side, little birds in that square. And that way they could, uh, they could uh, more effectively isolate the impacts of bats. So they also had a control plot, as you can see over on the far left. So they measured the number of insects on oak and hickory seedlings in the understory, and they also measured the amount of defoliation per seedling. And here is what they found. They found three times more insects and five times more defoliation on oak and hickory seedlings when bats were excluded, right? No surprise, we know they have an impact, but it's nice to kind of see some numbers to know what kind of impact they're having. And when you analyze oaks and hickory separately, the oaks experienced nine times more defoliation um, than when bats were excluded. And hickory, it was about three times. So as I said, they did allow birds access. And we also know that birds have a predatory impact on insect defoliators as well. So thinking about it that way, we know that these impacts probably would have been greater had birds been excluded from these structures as well. 
Now, to be clear, in the plots without bat predation, the seedlings didn't die due to their injuries. So the researchers kind of tracked those seedlings as they went on through the rest of the growing season. Um, so they did survive. But, you know, there's also this question of what those long-term impacts of that much defoliation is going to have, what, what those impacts are going to have on that plant if bats are continued to be excluded. Um, you know, would it make the plants or those seedlings more susceptible to drought or fungal diseases? So that's still a question that these researchers are looking to um, further investigate. But I think this study shows us, if nothing else, the impact that um, bats are having. We already know about the impacts birds having or birds are having. And we also know that there are population declines in both of these groups of animals. So something to really consider. It also just shows a really cool connection between bats and oaks. So now our other winged predators are helping our oaks out too, and not just the bats. Spoken like a true bat biologist, right? Our animals are better. No, I'm just kidding. I like birds too. Um, all right. We have over 1,400 uh, species of bats in the world. Roughly 21% uh, of all of our mammalian species are bats. And they're the second most diverse order right behind mammals or behind rodents, excuse me. So we see here that bats are not rodents. They belong to their own group of animals, okay? Now, despite the diversity of bats and their success in uh, mastering one of nature's most driving and challenging factors, competition, bats are exceptionally vulnerable to population declines. And that is because they're one of the slowest reproducing mammals on earth for their size. Right? Normally our small mammals have high reproductive rates. Bats do not. They only have, they only breed once a year. They only give birth once a year. And most of our bats only have one to two young per year. Now this is a red bat and it's one of the few species in Ohio that actually have more than one to two. Sometimes they can have three to four. But again, most of our bats, very few number of young and um, again, are only reproducing once a year. And now in a perfect world, this is absolutely fine right? They would have plenty of time to make up for that because bats are quite long-lived, especially for their size, but it's not a perfect world. And bats these days are encountering, encountering quite a few changes or challenges like disease, like collisions with wind turbines and buildings and other tall structures, just to name a few of the challenges. And given bats' biology and ecology, these challenges are proving very difficult to navigate, pun intended. So let's talk about what we can do to support bats by providing habitat. First, let's talk about what bats need. So we're all on the same page. They need roosts. These are places where bats are going to rest, give birth, or they're going to sleep. They need foraging grounds, places to eat. And these are going to, to vary depending on species. And we'll get into that here a little bit later. Bats are also going to need clean, cooled, open bodies of fresh water that are large enough for them to kind of swoop down and get a mouthful of water. They need that unobstructed swoop zone, if you will. Here is a diagram of the annual life cycle of some of our bats here in Ohio. And they're gonna need these resources that I just talked about um, during that colored portion of the year. Now, the bottom half of that cycle is also very important. It's just, we're focusing on the top part today because we're talking about forest management. But the bottom half of that um, of that cycle, the uh, when bats are overwintering and they'll overwinter in places that we call hibernacula, those hibernacula can be very varied, not just caves like you see on that diagram. They can be human-made structures, trees. Some of our bats are going to migrate to warmer climates. Today, again, I really want to focus on the top part of that cycle, but in the next slides where I'm gonna talk about some of our Ohio species, I'll comment here and there about their winter habitats because it really does relate to their population threats. And also hibernacula are important to consider for forest landowners because sometimes they're in forests or close to forests. And I think it's important for, for landowners and land managers to be able to recognize and protect those areas as well. So let's take a quick look at our species. Uh, we're going to start with our Lazarus and Lazio Nectaris genera, and I'll just start by saying if I mispronounce Latin names, I pronounce them in a way that I can remember how to spell them. So <laughs> apologies if any of you are up on your Latin out there and I mispronounce some things. 
But we have two members of the Lazarus genus. We have the red bat on the left and the hoary bat. The red bat is quite common, uh, and it's also the only uh, species in our state to display sexual dimorphism. So the, the female is what you see there, and the male is typically a little bit more red in color than the female. Our hoary bat is our largest Ohio bat, and some folks say that it's, it's our most colorful bat here in Ohio. Both of these belong to that Lazarus uh, genus, which means hairy tail. They have a furred patagium, which you can see in that picture on the left. Let me get my pointer. So the patagium is that flap of skin that stretches between the ankles of the bats and encompasses their tail. And on our red bat and hoary bat, it is fully furred. These bats are mostly solitary, so it helps to keep them warm. And also uh, during the, the breeding season when they're mostly solitary, it also helps to keep them warm, warm when they're resting uh, during their migrational journeys. Now, as far as migrational journeys, these three bats are our migratory bats. All of our bats are gonna undergo some type of migration, whether to where they're gonna hibernate or some of the bats like our hoary bat uh, travel out of Ohio in the fall and they fly to warmer places where they remain active or sometimes they're traveling through Ohio. The silver haired bat on the far right side of the screen, uh, they travel um, uh, through Ohio, most likely, as far as we know, at least in the spring and fall. So most of the individuals we see here uh, are generally migrating through the state, though we've found some hibernating in Ohio, still learning some things there about our silver haired bats. Red bats have also been found hibernating in some trees in Southern Ohio. Uh, and we're not quite sure how many are actually staying, how many are going. Um, so there's a lot we don't know about the migratory and winter habits of, of bats, including these species. But we do know that these species do undergo longer migrations than some of our other species. And because of that, these are the three that are most susceptible to population declines declines due to collisions with wind tur turbines and other buildings. All right, our next two species are big brown bat in the bottom left there, uh, one of our most common bats these days. Uh, Aptesicus, the uh, genus means house flyers. So this is a species that is comfortable using human habitats. I just went into an attic just yesterday of a friend and found five in there. So not uncommon to see that. Uh, it's one of our cave bat species, meaning that they undergo shorter migrations to hibernacula or places where they hibernate. These might be caves, and as we'll talk about in the end, they might be less traditional sites like cliff lines. Um, and like I said, we'll talk about that more at the end. But unlike the bat species we just looked at, big brown bats are colonial during the breeding season, so they're going to form maternity colonies of females that gather to birth and raise their pups. Now, the other species is the tricolor bat. We already talked a little bit about that one in the beginning, but they will form smaller colonies during the breeding uh, season. And like the big brown bat, they hibernate in caves as well as other hibernacula. Sometimes they'll use uh, human structures, but both of these species are susceptible to white nose syndrome. This species has the little red tag. You're gonna see that moving forward because that it denotes it as a state endangered species. And this little picture just kind of shows one of the morphological characteristics of tricolored bats. They have these dark black wing membranes and that nice pink arm, much different than you see with the big brown bat there. Next, we have the evening bat, which we know a little less about here in Ohio. We know they're migratory like the red and hoary bats that we discussed earlier. Some have been found migrating over 500 miles. They don't hibernate in caves, at least as far as we know here in Ohio. We're not sure though. Um, in Missouri though, they've been found hibernating in hollow caves and leaf litter. They look a lot like the big brown bat, but much smaller. As you can see in that larger picture from Keith Lott, look at the thumb and you can see how small that bat is, but they both kind of have that naked furless muzzle. Um, but again, evening bat, much smaller and rarely encountered here in Ohio. Well, last but not least, we have the genus Myotis, and we're gonna talk about one member of that genus first, the small-footed bat. It's the smallest bat that we have here in Ohio, and you can see its tiny feet there, its namesake in this picture. They also have kind of like a black face mask, which is different from our other Myotis species. We know a little bit less of the activity patterns of, of small-footed bats, where they're spending their time, 
Um, they're not very common here in Ohio either. And then we have the Indiana bat, the northern long-eared bat, and the little brown bat. Now, if you're a birder, you know the phrase little brown birds for those that are hard to identify. So these are the little brown birds of the bat world. We can tell them apart, but you need to know what you're doing. And a lot of times it comes down to toe, here, toe hair and ear length and some other um, distinguishing features. So if you wanna know about that, we can chat about that in the Q&A session. But we see those little red tags again, right? These three species are also state endangered. And of course the ones with the little star are federally endangered, right? All three of these species and the tricolored bat have undergone significant population declines. These are also our cave bats. Um, and that's where they're coming into contact with white nose syndrome. And that is what's led to their uh, recent listing as a state endangered species. And then uh, especially with the Northern long-eared bat as a federally endangered species, uplisted from threatened. All right, let's get into some habitat management. We're gonna talk about roosts. We're gonna talk about foraging grounds. We'll touch a little bit on, on water, but I really wanna focus more on those first two. And again, we're gonna be talking about those in the, in the context of the active time of year. I do just wanna note, I've mentioned it, but I'll mention again, just to avoid confusing, since this is a forest management talk, I'm gonna be talking about roosts more in the context of trees, but do realize that some of these species are gonna use other uh, areas for roosts. Um, you know, Several species are gonna use human structures, bridges, buildings, culverts, uh, especially little brown bats, right? Um, so again, I'll be focusing on trees, but later Eileen's going to touch a little bit on bat use of buildings. Okay, we're going to start with roost trees, and we'll talk a little bit about what bats are looking for as far as these roosts, and then a little bit on management at the same time. So some of our bats are going to roost in the foliage of trees. The hoary bat and the red bat and the tricolor bat are great examples of that. Now the hoary bat and the red bat are solitary roosters, as I said, meaning they are going to be by themselves during the breeding season, the, the uh, spring, summer, and fall, for the most part, um, except when it's a female and her pups uh, and with her pups. And I want to share this really cool video. If I click off of my laser pointer, this was captured by. Hopefully y'all can see it. If not, let me know in the chat. Um, it's not playing. Oh, it's because I clicked on something else. There we go. So this was captured by Elizabeth Bielk. And I would say it's not very common to see a female bat and her pups this far down in the canopy, but who knows what happened, something happened and she chose to stay here for at least this time being. But you can see she's got two pups, one on either side of her. Really, really cool fo footage to see. Uh, now, tricolored bats are also going to use cavities on occasion and uh, anthropogenic roosts as well, but they're going to form small maternity colonies in the for uh, foliage of trees as well. Most of our tree roosting bats are going to pretty frequently switch between roosts over successive days. This goes for solitary males and females as well as maternity colonies. Uh, for example, red bats in Indiana were found to switch roosts every one to four days and often between several trees that were within 200 to 300 meters of one another, so relatively close to one another. And they're likely switching roosts to avoid pred uh, predation and or possibly to seek varying temperature based on their needs. So temperature is an important characteristic that bats select for when choosing a roost site. Uh, we see bats that use foliage. Uh, we see this in bats that use foliage, but we also see bats uh, switching roosts that use cavity roosts as well, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But they, the maternity colonies especially, or the females that are, are birthing and getting ready to birth their pups, they really like it warm. And so a lot of times they're going to select for trees that are in gaps or along forest edges just for that warmth. Near water is a great, another great location for a roost tree, especially for our females that are lactating, that does 
put uh, quite a, some pressure for, for water on them. And for the most part, our foliage roosting bats are going to select for overstory trees with larger crowns. It does depend on the species of the bats, but I'd say most of our foliage roosting bats here in Ohio are going to select for deciduous trees. Uh, for example, Thames and other reported that tricolor bats really preferred broad leaves, especially oaks and hickories in particular. We've seen similar research from red bats as well. Um, I popped up a picture of a Seminole bat, which is not a bat species that is established here in Ohio, but we have caught a few here and there, or we have records of some, and we actually caught one during bat blitz, which was very surprising. Um, but this is just an example of a species that has been found roosting uh, more north of us in their habits in pine trees. And when they're roosting, as you can kind of see here, they're sometimes indistinguishable from higher up, uh, if you're looking higher up from those pine cones. So they really are kind of de depending on that camouflage and our bats here in Ohio do that as well, especially our red bats and our hoary bats that are more brown or red in coloration. They really do look like kind of a dead dried leaf as they're roosting up there in the canopy. And then we have bats that prefer to roost in cavities or crevices in both live and dead trees. They will also use spaces under uh, shedding bark as you can see here in this picture. This is actually uh, an Indiana a bat maternity roost tree. And uh, other spe some species that are gonna use this type of habitat are the Indiana bat that you see there and a lot of our other myota species like little browns and northern longyards, and of course our big brown bats as well. All of those species will form maternity col colonies and they're gonna go to these places to have those colonies or to, to roost. And the males of these species are often gonna go to those same places. They may by, be by themselves or they may form small groups. So like I said, with these bats, they are going to roost switch as well. And they're often going to select trees mostly based on specific characteristics like height, diameter, level of decay, and the location because that ties um, a lot of times to temperature. And we already talked about how temperature is important. It's important to these bats as well, especially those maternity colonies. So I do wanna talk about uh, cavity and crevice roosts and bark roosts in, in a little bit more detail, especially since these are the roosts that some of our endangered species are looking for. And because a lot of times these roost trees are considered the most important habitat component uh, for these species during their active time of year. So we're going to answer some questions. How many? Which ones? Where should they be located? First of all, we'll start with how many. And I'm going to direct your attention to that quote in green. It's from Forest Management and Bats, lovely pub publication from 2020. And I'll show you where you can access that publication at the end of my presentation. But it states that forest landowners can maintain bat populations by providing a continuous supply of potential roost trees. That's a great goal to have, whether you are managing for bats or other species of wildlife. Lots of different species are going to appreciate these dead standing trees, right? So how many? There's no magic number, right? We do know that bats are going to need multiple roosts. It's gonna support that roost switching that we talked about. And a snag is a short lived resource, right? A dead standing tree is not gonna stay dead and standing forever. Well, it's not gonna stay standing forever. Um, so this figure from Bergeson and others is just kind of showing that this is uh, use of northern long-eared bats, and you can see that they're using both live and dead trees uh, with some of those cavity features and lots of different species, right? So for bats, we strive to leave as many dead, damaged, and dying trees as we possibly can, as long, of course, as they're not posing a safety threat. And remember that mature forest stands are, are going to naturally produce snags. So if managing for mature forest patches is a goal, then that's, that's gonna be good and it's gonna help promote um, this continuous supply of snags. Which ones, right? So the structure or the characteristic of a snag is going to be more important than the species. And I kind of touched on that already. For example, we hear a lot about Indiana bats and shagbark hickories. And don't get me wrong, that's a great tree to have out there for bats. The sloughing bark pro provides some great roost sites. But if we're talking about Indiana bat maternity colonies, 
their favorite place is going to be a large hardwood with sloughing bark and lots of sun exposure, like you see there on the right. Okay, so a lot of times it does come down to the structure and characteristics and not necessarily the species. Sometimes the species does dictate the quality of a snag, right? Softer woods may be more susceptible to woodpecker damage and you'll be creating those cavities that bats will use in the future. Some trees are going to last longer on the landscape than others, depending on the species. So we can factor that in as well, but I just wanna stress, stress that the structure is really important. So we, we try to select for snags that are in the earlier stages of decay, and that's going to ensure that there's more bark coverage. Uh, generally, we talk about larger snags that extend into the canopy and are going to stand longer, but we do know that for some species, smaller snags are also used. And these are three pictures of roosts that were used by northern long-eared bats during the breeding season. So we know that they do sometimes select for trees that are in partial shade and that are lower in the canopy. Uh, so that's where we start to see things like, you know, roost trees greater than three inches in diameter can potentially be uh, available and, and used by our northern long-eared bats. Consider retaining as many trees as you're walking around in your woods. If you see some that are already damaged, excavated by woodpeckers, there's evidence from Indiana that little brown bats like to use woodpecker uh, cavities, but just live trees as well that may turn into snags down the road. Trees with broken or forked tops, wounds, cavities, evidence of rot, etc. Those trees that you know we call cull trees, um, those can be left behind to be snags in the future. So something to consider and think about. Where is a big consideration? First, the quote at the top: the value of a recently harvested stand for a variety of wildlife, including bats is greatly enhanced by leaving snags and future snags within a harvest area. So research has been reporting that bat activity is very compatible with forest management, including harvesting. We will take a closer look at that when we discuss foraging grounds here in just a minute. Uh, but if snags are retained, we are finding that bats are selecting for those snags in those harvested areas or along the edges of those harvest areas. Um, Indiana bats, for example, have been found using um, snags in clearings, in shelter wood cuts, much more than we expected for those maternity roosts. But when you think about it, it makes sense because they really want that sun exposure and an open area is gonna provide that. So generally speaking, snags should be well distributed across the landscape, and that's going to account from various species or for various species needs. But you could target the, those snags or retaining those snags in, in certain uh, spaces that we know are going to be nice. Edges, openings, gaps that are gonna allow more sunlight to hit those snags. Uh, riparian areas and forest corridors, bats use those areas quite a bit for foraging, but if there can be snags uh, and other roost trees retained there, that's gonna be great as well. And then you might consider clustering snag near some of those preferred spots. Clustering is going to allow for that roost switching, and if you can incorporate some live trees as well, that's going to protect those snags from wind throw, and that's what you're looking at in this picture from the U.S. Forest Service. So I'm going to stop uh, the roost tree management discussion, and I'll just say that snag creation is also an option. I know I didn't touch on that too much. Retaining existing snags is going to be more cost effective, but you can definitely create snags if you're walking through your woods and you're thinking, I just don't have that many. I want more out there. Um, that's something that you can do. This is a webinar that we did not too long ago on, well, it's probably a couple of years ago now, but it's all about Deadwood for Wildlife and it's available for viewing on our Woodland Stewards website. Let's get into a discussion on foraging grounds. So a few things before we start on requirements. Bats forage in a variety of different spaces. Of course, in forests and along edges, I've mentioned that, along river corridors and streams, over ponds and lakes, in forest openings. So lots of different, uh, lots of different spaces. And even though we talk about bats as a group of species, like I'm doing here today, we do need to remember that each of the 10 different species here in Ohio has their own unique ecology. 
And just like we saw differences in roost tree preferences, we're gonna see difference in uh, preferences for foraging grounds. When it comes to the size of the foraging grounds, bats are really mobile. So we are talking about large distances, some of which are probably not going to encompass all of the land that you own. You can see some differences in sizes of a few species up there on the screen. And then bats are going to forage in different ways. They have different feeding strategies. Some are going to like to feed um, below the canopy, some in the canopy, some above, in openings on edges like we've kind of talked about already. And a lot of times their feeding strategy is going to be dictated by differences in their morphology and their echolocation call structure, something we call echomorphology. So what echomorphology is all about is differences in wing shape, in body shape, and echolocation call structure are going to dictate habitat use, right? That echomorphology is going to dictate that habitat use. So this is kind of a neat graphic that I recently found out of California uh, by Blakely and others. And I thought it illustrated this concept well. I'm a visual learner, so I like to find illustrations that explain things. What you're looking at here is smaller body bats on the left side of that figure, smaller body bats that have higher frequency calls of increasing duration. They're able to forage in areas with higher canopy cover, um, more basal area, more trees per acre, basically more dense um, uh, forests, whereas bats with on the other end of the spectrum with um, larger bodies and lower frequency calls, those calls are going to travel farther. So they're more adapted for foraging in those more open, less dense areas. Now, to be clear on this, at the end, the right end of that, that's a Mexican free-tailed bat. That's not a species that we have here in Ohio. But the hoary bat would be a good example of an Ohio species that likes to forage in more open spaces, like forested openings over water and above canopies. In the middle, we might have our big brown bat and our Eastern red bat. These are bats that like the edges. They also will forage above the canopy um, and they will definitely take advantage of open spaces in the understory and midstory of a forest. So that's what I found in my research when those shelterwood harvests were conducted, they did a mid-story thinning prior, and it really created that open understory. And these two species, as well as tricolors, really took advantage of that. And then at the far end, we have uh, our myotis species, especially the northern long-eared bat. They like foraging or are adapted to foraging in those more dense areas. But that said, bats don't always read the scientific literature, right? So while they're adapted to forage in certain areas, they don't always just use those spaces. For example, some of our myota species um, that are able to forage in the interior, they do, but they're also going to use openings and edges, small openings and edges. So the northern long-eared bat and the Indiana bat have both been found using different forest openings from clear, uh, small clearings to thinnings to small acreage clear cuts. So I just like to start here when discussing foraging grounds, just so we all know uh, the differences among species. And also kind of a bottom line is that diversity in foraging grounds is really important for these, uh, for many different species or to account for many different species. So I'll just go over some strategies to maintain and create foraging habitat. One would be to create small uh, openings of less than five acres or so. And when you do this, you're going to be creating some foraging space for some of those more open adapted species, but also those species that like edges. Um, at the same time, you're gonna be creating a flush of growth um, on the forest floor. And that of course is going to encourage some insect prey. Always making sure that that flush of growth is not non-native invasive species, right? I know you all have heard this before, and some of you, this is your daily job, but managing non-native non -native invasive species is key. And we wanna make sure we can do our best to get those somewhat under control before we open up the canopy. Now, the size of the clearing should definitely be based on your surrounding landscape. We always wanna remember that retaining forest cover is key and the roost trees that exist in that forest cover is key. You know, if you're in Western Ohio, where we don't have a lot of large contiguous patches of forest, maybe clearing a larger acreage may not be the best option for you. 
We just want to make sure that that loss of potential roost trees does not offset the benefit of creating that foraging habitat. Okay. Another kind of a way that you can create a small opening within your woods is also to create a pond. This is a really nice option if you're willing to do it, especially in upland areas where other sources of water may not be as um, accessible or as frequent. Um, and we've talked about how water is, an, is very important to our bats, especially our um, pregnant and lactating females. A few other things that you could do would be to thin dense stands. So this is typically done to reduce tree density and create growing spaces for the remaining trees. Depending on how heavy it's thinned, this could benefit bats by maybe opening up uh, and creating some additional flight space. It could also encourage growth on the forest floor for insect prey. In mature stands, a uh, mid-story reduction that really targets some of those smaller suppressed trees in the understory can be another way to open up space for bats foraging underneath the canopy. So again, that's what was done in my study sites prior to that shelter wood harvest. A mid-story reduction can also be done uh, in conjunction with a prescribed burn, and that burn is gonna work to reduce fuels on the forest floor. It's also going to regenerate uh, trees or encourage regeneration of trees and herbaceous growth, which as we talked about, good for the insects, good for the bats. Sometimes though, fire can have short-term negative impacts on bats. Snags or stumps could be eliminated. If there's a really nice roost tree and you wanna avoid um, harm coming to it, you could maybe create a little break around it to help mitigate that loss So something to keep in mind. And then the other thing to consider is when to light the fires. So in the fall, maybe if you can, uh, light, light the fires on warmer days or at least later in the day. Anybody know why that is? Well, it has to do with red bats. So <laughs> red bats have been found hibernating in leaf litter, not lead litter. I don't know what lead litter is, leaf litter. Sorry for that typo. Uh, this was first discovered in some of our Southern states when a prescribed burn, a burn was lit and it was going through the forest floor and the researchers saw, um, uh, or the burn bosses saw red bats popping out of the leaf litter and flying away. This picture is from Tennessee, um, but we suspect it's a possibility that red bats do that here. We found them during the winter in Southern Ohio, so it is possible that they do this here too. And if the day is too cold, the bats may not be able to wake up fast enough to escape from the fire. So something to consider. Now many, I mentioned this already, many bat species will utilize riparian areas. So maintaining healthy riparian buffers is a great thing to do. They're gonna provide drinking water, that foraging habitat. And if they're located in mature stands, there's usually going to be some roost trees. So it's kind of a trifecta for bats. This is a picture of a roost tree along a river corridor in the Columbus and Franklin County Metro Parks that an Indiana bat colony was using. Uh, they've been monitoring this colony for many years now. So thanks to Carrie Morrow, if you're on the call for, um, for this picture and the information you've shared with me over the years on this colony. It's just been really neat watching them switch trees over the years as these trees deteriorate or they change. I think one tree was even created by a beaver um, they, the beaver girdle it, turn it into a snag, and then the Indiana bats used it, which is really cool. So um, this is typical behavior of Indiana bats and a lot of our colonial bats. They return to the same site year after year, even if they're not in that exact same tree. But even if roosts aren't located along or in riparian areas, bats are still using these forested corridors to travel to and from feeding areas. So working to connect forest patches by creating corridors or enhancing riparian buffers is a great um, management objective for bats and many other wildlife species as well. So next I want to jump into a discussion on some timber, timber harvest methods and talk about how they can benefit bats and the impacts that they can have on bat habitat. Previous work has shown that many species of bats are active in timber harvests, some more, than in unharvested parts of the forest. So if your goal down the road is to conduct a timber harvest, don't think that you can't also at the same time provide bat habitat. Um, you most definitely can. 
especially if you work to retain some of those important re uh, resources we've talked about, like those roost trees. I hope you enjoy that up close picture. <laughs> All right, let's discuss some even aged regenerative cuts first, which if you don't know what I mean by that, those are cuts that are designed to remove all or most of the trees in the stand in order for new trees to take their place. So you're essentially creating a new forest that will be the same age or an even age. In this example, we're talking about a clear cut, right? And that's when you're essentially removing all the trees in an area. And we've already talked a little bit about the benefits of clearing uh, some trees for bats. And so a lot of the benefits are gonna be the same. Depending on the size, you're going to create some foraging grounds for some of our more open adapted foragers like our hoary bats. You're going to create edges for our big browns, our red bats, and some of our myota species. And of course, you're going to get that flush of growth that is going to support insect populations. Now, as to the size, research is ongoing. There's still a lot we need to know about how bats respond to forest manage management practices, but it does seem that the smaller uh, clear cuts 10 acres of less may be best. And as we've talked about, it depends on the species. Our red bats, hoary bats, big browns, they have been reported um, foraging in the center of clear cuts two acres in size, and that's coming from Indiana and Illinois. Whereas some of our myota species like northern long-eared bats and the Indiana bats, they do prefer to forage in mature forests that have had that mid-story reduction. Um, or along the edges. So it does seem that our northern long-eared bats have a lower tolerance for large open spaces. Um, but that said, they're still going to utilize the edges if you decide to do a cut like this. And let's be frank, the early successional habitat, that young forest habitat that you see there on the right side, that you get as a result of these even-aged harvest practices are so valuable these days, not just to, to bats, but to many other species of wildlife, you know, your game species, your songbirds, we could go on and on. Um, this is a rare habitat in the state these days. So even if you're not going to support all of the bats with this type of um, a practice, you're, you're still gonna be benefiting some species and a lot of other wildlife species. But if you work to, I've said it before, I'll say it again, if you work to retain snags and maybe some of those cull trees within the patch, you're gonna really increase the value of this type of a practice. Now with clear cuts, just like any other harvesting, it's really important to work with a forester. They're going to be able to help you achieve your regeneration goals that you have for your forest. Um, and I will, in just a few slides, direct you to where you can find a forester if you don't already know. This is a neat graphic that I wanted to share from Purdue since we're talking about clear cuts. And in this, uh, this is from one of their uh, fact sheets, Managing Your Woods for White-Tailed Deer. And they have this cool figure where they're estimating the amount of deer forage or regenerative growth after um, different regenerative methods. So, you know, on the, on the even aged method side of things, you're going to have, of course, a lot more of that um, herbaceous and seedling growth. But I just wanted to share this with you because I think sometimes when we think about clear cuts, we have this image in our minds of, oh, the trees are just gone and there's this barren area, but it does not take long for that flush of growth to start and it comes in rather quickly. And so sometimes it's nice to focus on that rather than that loss of trees, that new forest you're creating. So for this publication, obviously, they're focusing on this abundance of diverse forage for white-tailed deer food, but with bats, the goal would be creating that diverse plant community that's going to su support that diverse insect uh, community. So just wanted to give a shout out to my colleague at Purdue, Jared Brooke, for this awesome fact sheet and his willingness to let me snatch photos from it. Next, we have a shelterwood harvest. This is another even aged management practice. And this is when a percentage of the trees in the stand are removed, and that can be anywhere from 30 to 70%. And usually those that are left behind are providing shade for regenerating seedlings. Here in Ohio, a lot of times it's done to regenerate oak seedlings. And then after the first few years of establishment, those overstory trees are removed, and that's where you get your even age stand. So the shelterwood harvests, especially after that, 
um, final removal, you're going to get a lot of the same benefits as we talked about for clear cuts, so I won't reiterate them. But what you do get with the shelter wood in the meantime, before those overstory trees are removed, is you know you get some of those live trees that are re retained as, as possible roost sites for our foliage roosting bats. And as we talked about during our roost tree discussion, if you can possibly retain some snags in the harvest area, especially around some of those live trees, then you're gonna um, pr be protecting those snags from windfall and be providing that roost tree source in the harvest area as well. In the interest of time, and, and I'm pretty much out of time, um, I'm only gonna discuss one even age practice, uh, uneven age practice. So uneven age practices, that's when we're working to leave a variety of tree sage, sizes and ages, and we're creating gaps uh, in the canopy. This one is a group selection. You're removing small groups of trees to regenerate a new age class. So because a lot of times these are much smaller, gaps, you're going to maintain a lot of that mature forest and the roost trees that exist in it. But then at the same time, you're also providing some of those smaller gaps that we talked about earlier on that are going to provide some foraging opportunity for bats. Okay, I said I'd show you a slide to reach out to a trained professional. Cannot stress that um, enough. Definitely talk to somebody before you cut to make sure that you are going to be meeting your goals um, for after that harvest is conducted. So you can go to the Ohio Society of American Foresters directory. The link is in red there, or you can call, call before you cut the number and uh, the website is down there below. Bottom line when it comes to foraging ground management is diversity. Okay, mature forest openings, edges, you can read everything there on that screen. And then when you're removing trees, really try your best to kind of retain as many of those potential roost trees as you possibly can, those dead standing trees. A few more things to remind you of uh, before I wrap up. Consider tree removal outside of the maternity season. Generally, that is mid-May to the end of July. So I'll pop up that little birthing calendar for a lot of our bats here. Arriving at those roost sites in April, having their young May through June, and usually by July or the end of July, those young are out and about foraging. So if we can avoid those roost trees coming down during that time, that is best. And now I will say that depending on the bat species we are considering, um, removing those dates for removing trees are going to um, differ. And we're gonna hear more about that when we hear from Angie. I also just wanna reiterate the importance of water. We talked about that already. And the importance of non-native invasive species management. Both of these are going to benefit all bat species in Ohio. Aim for that diverse, heterogeneous landscape and know that bats do tolerate forest uh, disturbance and in many cases they rely on it, but there's still a lot we have to learn. For example, we don't know much about how these different forest practices affect the health and the survival and the reproductive success of bats, so we're still learning. I said I would share with you a place to find more information and especially on our declining species. When I reached out to the Fish and Wildlife Service about you know, what forest landowners can do for these sensitive species, they recommended this publication. And this has been posted on the Ohio Bat Working Group website for quite some time now. It's a great one. So I will share specific information on these species, this is a great guide to go to. I really tried to kind of provide information that supports the management of bat assemblages in your forest. But again, if you want specific details, um, go to this publication. And you can find it on the Ohio Bat Working Group's website. Click on our habitat management tab and you can see the list of resources right there. And then this one is that forest management and bats guide that I referred to earlier in the presentation. And that, along with the other ones listed there, are some good resources if you want to learn more. So going back to um, our, you know, our sensitive species, I do, well, and even before we get there, I do want to touch a little bit on hibernacular requirements. Uh, you know, here's our annual life cycle. So we're talking about this part again. And during this time, most of our bats here in Ohio, we talked about some that are, most of our bats here in Ohio are hibernating. We talked about some that are migrating out of the state, but a lot of them are hibernating. Some are gonna use trees and cavities. 
some are gonna use human-made structures, and some are gonna use geological features. And some of these hibernacula are traditional, meaning we've known about them for quite some time. Examples would be caves, uh, abandoned mines, culverts, railroad tunnels, and then some of them are non-traditional. These are like cliff lines and rock, uh, rock outcroppings and rock rubble within the forest. So, you know, if you have some of these on your property, it's important to realize that. And those might be parts or places that you mark on your maps, and you highlight in your management plans as areas that are important and may support bats. And this is just a few pictures of some uh, spaces in Southern Ohio. There's a little crevice in a rock and that's what it looks like close up. And in this video that I will mute because it's loud, you see a hibernating big brown bat. Okay, so we're, we're learning a lot about what these bats, how these bats are using non-traditional hibernacula. This is a big uh, area of research of Joe Johnson, who is a researcher with the University of Cincinnati. And this is a picture that one of his students took and they actually located some Northern long-eared bats to this little pile of rocks in the woods that you may not think much about. So there may be spaces like this that, the, that you have in your woods that you might say, oh, okay, that might be a spot that supports bats. And maybe that's an area of your woods that you really focus on providing some good, healthy forest around. So these bats, when they emerge from hibernation, have a safe place, and good habitat to go to. So if Joe Johnson's name sounds familiar, he gave a great uh, webinar last year on uh, the winter life of bats. It's still posted on our website if you wanna hear more about it. And during his presentation, he showed a graph that I felt was very impactful. This is it, basically just sharing how over the years, the number of little brown bats that were counted in winter hibernacula declined dramatically once white nose syndrome came on the scene. So this is not a white nose syndrome talk. This is a forest management talk, but we can't talk about bats, especially those that were recently listed as endangered without talking about white nose syndrome. Um, and you know those endangered species and their protections influence how and when we can conduct some of these forest practices that I've been talking about. So I'm just very quickly gonna go over white nose and then I'm gonna turn it over to Angie. So if you're not familiar with white nose syndrome, it's called by, caused by an invasive non-native fungus. Origin is in Europe. We think that it got here on contaminated caving equipment. It's a cold loving fungus. And we have that disease triangle. It's a perfect example of that disease triangle. You have the perfect environment, a nice cool cave. You have a susceptible host in our bats and you have the pathogen, the fungus. Boom, you get white nose syndrome. How is it killing bats? Basically it's causing them to wake up more than they should during hibernation. And when you're a small animal that's trying to live through the winter with no food and water, that's a problem, right? If you wanna learn more about white nose syndrome, that website is the best source, at least that I have found um, on all things white nose syndrome. Here you see the spread map. I think we're up to 40 states and eight Canadian provinces that the disease has been found in. There's an additional three states and two Canadian provinces that the fungus has been found in. It got to Ohio in 2011. It spread bat to bat, and it can also be spread by the movement of fungal spores, uh, fungal spores. So those can get stuck to clothing, shoes, and other equipment. Um, and that's how we think it, it got here in the first place. So it's one of the most devastating wildlife epidemics in recorded history because of the fast spread, because of the high mortality rates, which are roughly 70 to 100% in the places where it's been found. How do we estimate bat populations? We go into the hibernacula and count them, and then we do misnet work throughout the state. So just to show you the declines of these three species that were recently stated listed, um, this is from 560 different hibernacula in 24 states. So you see, when we say population declines have been severe, we're not, we're not just saying that. And then this is capture data, summer misnet capture data from Ohio. Prior to white nose syndrome, about 55% of our captures were those three species, after 2%. And I know this only goes to 2018, but I don't think it's changed much. And Angie and Eileen, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. So this is why these three species were added to the state endangered least species list and why the northern long-eared bat was uplisted to endangered earlier this year. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to let Angie take over and talk to us a little bit about the northern long-eared bat's status 
and what it means to forest landowners and forest land managers. So thanks all and Angie, take it away. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, make sure I get the right one. Are you seeing my slideshow? Nope, we're seeing your PowerPoint. Okay. Start. Sometimes it takes a second. Yeah. Fill your PowerPoint. Okay. Still, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. Does that work? <laughs> no, we still see your PowerPoint. I know I'm you sure. had it before. It was perfect when we were practicing. I know. <laughs> um, I may be sharing the wrong screen. Let me try it again. Sure. Bear with me. You're fine. Um, let's try this one. There you go. Okay. And then the magic trick you shall see. For the presenter view. <laughs> I think if you right click on your screen. Aha. Uh -huh. Choose. Oh, yeah. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Well, first, I want to say um, I am very pleased there are so many folks that joined today to learn more about bats and um, forest management for bats. Um, and Marnie did a wonderful job going over um, the needs of bats and the individual species. So a little bit of this might be um, redundant. So I will kind of fly through some of that stuff um, and not spend too much time on the life history of any of these, these listed bats. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about recent and upcoming bat listings actions that the Fish and Wildlife Service um, has been and is currently working on. Um, next slide. Okay, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, is comprised of multiple um, different programs, and um, including some of them I've, I've listed on this slide. Um, this is but not, not all of them, um, but th these may be the ones that you're a little more familiar with. Um, I'm in, e in an ecological services field office. Um, my office is located in Columbus, Ohio, and our jurisdiction out of my office is the entire state of Ohio. Um, and one of the focuses of ecological services is administering the Endangered Species Act. Protections of the Endangered Species Act are important for protecting and recovering species in danger of extinction. Species may be evaluated for federal listing under the Endangered Species Act in two ways. A discretionary review, review is one that the Fish and Wildlife Service initiates in-house. Also, any person or group may petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to evaluate a species for listing. In order to evaluate a species for listing, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducts a species status assessment. It's often referred to as an SSA. And it's important to understand the definitions of endangered species and threatened species. Um, so when we evaluate a species for listing, we must determine if the species meets the definition of either endangered or threatened. If it does, we will publish um, a proposed listing rule or make the species a candidate if the, if the listing is precluded by higher priority listing actions. Next slide. Um, all threatened species do not, um, do not need to have a 4D rule. Um, and this is a rule that um, when we list a species as threatened, we will also, we have the option of including a 4D rule. Um, and what a 4D rule does is it takes the place of the normal protections of the Endangered Species Act, and it can either increase or decrease the normal protections. Um, the ESA uh, specifies that 4D rules must be necessary and advisable to provide for the conservation of a species. Not all threatened species will have 4D rules, um, 
If they don't have a 4D rule, the species receives the same protections as an endangered species. I'm just gonna go through this really quick. This is a species that has been listed for many, many years. Um, the Indiana bat was listed um, in 1967. Um, so not due to white nose, um, its decline was um, more due to, to people um, and habitat loss, pesticide use, you know, um, declines in their suitable habitat. Um, and Marnie went over the life history quite well of all these bats. So all of our Ohio species are insectivores. Um, and as she also mentioned, most of them, like the Indiana bat, can have only one pup per year. So when you're a rare species, if you're only capable of having one pup per year, the conservation of that species is very important. Um, here are some potential uh, roost trees for Indiana bats. In fact, there was actually a bat using the upper um, left tree as a roost. And for maternity colonies, um, Generally for Indiana bats, they like, as Marnie pointed out, they like those um, bigger trees that get lots of sunlight that have large areas of sloughing bark. Um, and one thing that's very important to note about the Indiana bat is that females have strong site fidelity, meaning uh, the colonies will return year after year to the same area to reform their colonies and have their pups. Um, they will even return to the same trees that they used in previous years. So maintaining habitat over time is very important to this species. They need roost trees now and trees that will become roosts over time. So in the Northern Longer Bat, this, this is the one that um, we recently um, reclassified as an endangered species. It was listed as a threatened species in 2015. Um, as uh, following a petition, uh, we were petitioned in 2010 to list the species. And the species has oops, undergone drastic declines due to white nose syndrome. So this is just a, a timeline to show you all the many things that have happened in the past 13 years um, for this species. Originally, we were petitioned to list in 2010. Um, in 2013, we proposed to list it as endangered. Um, the year later, we reopened that comment period. And then ultimately in 2015, we published a final rule listing the species as threatened with an interim 4D rule. Um, a year later, that, in, that 4D rule was finalized. And then after some litigation, um, the courts uh, remanded the service to reevaluate the listing status of the Northern long ear bat. Um, so we did one of those SSAs, those species status assessments, and determined that the species now met the definition of endangered. So we published a proposed rule to reclassify the northern long ear bat as an endangered species. And this took effect in uh, earlier this year. So with uh, the reclassification as endangered, the northern long ear bat can no longer have a 4D rule because those are only applicable, you can only have 4D rules for species listed as threatened. Um, and because that 4D rule went away, um, the service developed some streamlining tools uh, to assist folks um, who are doing projects, um, help them to uh, minimize potential impacts on um, the Northern long ear bat. So we have um, an IPAC D key, and that's a lot of acronyms. Um, uh, IPAC stands for Information for Planning and Consultation. And a D key is a decision key that's within that IPAC system that you can run through a series of questions um, and, and you will get a response as to how your project may impact that species. Um, and it can be used for um, consultation um, the official Section 7 consultation that federal agencies do with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but we actually, um, we recommend that federal agencies do not use it because they still need to come talk to us um, about the Indiana bat because the Indiana bat does not have a decision key. 
So it's a bit redundant to spend all that time doing the dekey and then come to us to talk about the Indiana bat when we can just collectively um, include the Northern in our, in our discussions about the Indiana bat. Um, so for federal projects, there's, there's also currently a streamlining tool that um, can streamline consultation um, with Fish and Wildlife Service. It's, it's not been used a whole lot because we still have the Indiana bat, does not have these, um, these kind of tools right now. So um, it's just a, a streamlined way to do consultation if we need to for the species. There's also some wind guidance um, for operating wind turbines and siting of um, wind, whoops, one more on there. And then there's some gentle, this is probably more applicable to this group. There's the um, interim habitat modification guidance. It's general guidance. It's, it's geared towards non-federal projects, projects that do not have any kind of um, federal money or federal permit um, associated with them. And you can find these tools. Um, I'm not advertising for Google, but if you Google Northern long Ear Bat, um, the first or second link that pops up should take you to the Northern long Ear Bat webpage with the Fish and Wildlife Service, where you can find these tools. Okay, moving on to the tricolored bat. Um, this species, um, it's it's similar um, in its life history to the other, um, the northern long ear bat and the Indiana bat. Um, one notable difference is that they, they tend to roost among live and dead leaf clusters rather than under under bark um, or in cavities. Um, again, they can only have one pup per year, and they've under, undergone drastic declines. Um, and that's that last slide I think you had up, Marnie, was um, saying in 2018 that collectively these species were maybe 2% of the bats captured in Ohio. I would say that's it's much less than that now. Oh, okay. Good to know. Most of the most of the bats captured in Ohio now are um, red bats and big brown bats. It's rare to get a myotis. It's real, it's rare to get a tricolored. And it, it used to be, you, you caught them everywhere on the landscape, but that white nose syndrome has um, just decimated their population. So the service was petitioned to list this uh, tricolored bat in 2016 due to those declines from white nose syndrome. Um, a, a, a species status assessment was completed for the tricolored bat, and it was determined by the service that the species meets the definition of an endangered species. And a, uh, a proposed rule to list the species as endangered published in September of 2022. And currently um, we are working on um, to complete our final determination um, for that species. And the final determination is one of two things. One, we move forward and publish a final rule officially listing the species or we remove it, um, we remove our um, proposal to list. I think that um, is unlikely at this point. So um, it, I anticipate in the next um, few months, give or take a few months, um, that uh, we could be seeing some uh, movement on our final determination for the species. Um, little brown bat is um, the next species I'm going to talk a little about. This is um, this is not a petition species. This is a species that the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing a discretionary listing review um, due to declines from white nose syndrome. Um, and as a discretionary review, um, we're not under any kind of settlement deadline to list the species, but this is on our listing work plan, our national listing work plan um, for our listing decision to occur sometime in uh, our fiscal year 24, which um, we're in now, and that is through September 30th of 2024.
Um, this map shows you the, the range of the little brown bat. Um, you can see it's very extensive, um, which also adds a level of complexity to reviewing the status of the species um, that, that is so wide ranging. Um, and you see that Ohio, um, the entire state of Ohio is in the species range. And in this next slide, it's combined Indiana bat, northern long ear bat, and tricolor bat ranges. Um, and you can see that all three of those ranges completely overlap Ohio. Um, so anywhere in Ohio where suitable habitat for any of these four bat species occurs, um, the species could be present. <clears throat> so some potential um, cons bat conservation measures, things that you can do that um, help to be protective um, of the bats. Um, one thing is the seasonal tree clearing. Um, so you can avoid cutting trees during the bats active season, which in Ohio really is April through September. Um, that's the period where they're roosting in trees. Um, near hibernacula, they may, they will be using trees later into the year, such as um, they, while they're doing their swarming behavior, that's when they're mating, they're swarming around, congregating um, around areas where they may hibernate. And so late into like mid-November, they may still be using trees around those areas. Um, you can avoid clearing um, high quality habitat. Some of those features um, where you've got mature forest, you've got, uh, a, you know, a snags, retain snags, retain trees around snags, make sure you retain some larger trees over time so that they can become roost trees in the future. Um, another option um, is to have a summer presence absence survey uh, performed. And, and this is probably going to be more geared towards larger, uh, larger forestry projects. Um, these having someone do these surveys, it definitely can add a, a, a cost to a project. So if it's a large scale project and you want to know what bats you have out there, adding a presence absence survey may be, may be a good option um, so that you, you know if, if you really need to be concerned for these listed bat species, but also what, what species you may have in your landscape, even if they're not listed um, and develop a way to, uh, a plan to help um, conserve them over time. And I will point out that my office, my agency, we do not actually do those surveys. Um, we have a lot of folks that hold federal permits that allow them to do these surveys. Um, we just don't have the resources to um, actually conduct the surveys ourselves. If you're interested um, in having a survey done, you can contact me. I have a very extensive list of folks that have those permits that can do the surveys for you. Um, and then lastly, if, if you cannot avoid, um, entirely avoid impacts, um, you may wanna consider doing some kind of mitigation, um, some offsetting measure, whether that be planting trees, um, taking an area um, that doesn't, you know, out of allowing it to regenerate or planting trees to help create a little more forest on the landscape, that can always be good. Um, flight corridors, um, like retaining fence rows, tree-lined fence rows, or adding features that imitate those fence rows that can help bats move across the landscape um, and, and forage and have the safety of some cover while they're moving, let's say, to a stream to a riparian area where they may go forage. So <clears throat> section seven, I. I'm not going to get into the, the weeds on this. This is um, the part of the Endangered Species Act that requires federal agencies to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service for any discretionary action they propose to carry out, fund, or permit that may affect a federally listed species. So basically, if it's a project and let's say someone needs a Corps of Engineers permit um, because there's some wetland impacts and they're going to cut trees, that's a may affect. If they're going to re, um, remove trees, 
that federal agency, the core in this example, they need to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service. They're required to. Um, Non-federal projects, projects that have no federal nexus, there is no requirement to come to the Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife, <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Service to um, get technical assistance. However, we are very happy to provide technical assistance upon request. Um, and we can, um, we can provide you with our recommendations for how we think you could um, implement uh, some conservation measures to minimize the risk to bats and still going, for, going forward and carrying out your project. And we recognize the, um, the importance of managing forests for them to be healthy. Um, that does include cutting trees. So, but there's a balance that we, we, we always try to find that balance of allowing a project to go forward, but at the same time, um, instituting some measures um, that we recommend to be protective of the bats. Um, if there is a federal nexus for your project, you are very much encouraged to come to our office first um, so that in, you can incorporate our, um, our recommendations into the project early on so that if the consultation happens later in time, we have recommendations and that federal agency who's giving you the money or the permit may require you to do certain things that we have recommended. So it's better if you get in on the front end of that and, and incorporate those recommendations up front to avoid cost, additional costs, to avoid delays down the road. Um, like, um, so as I said, if there's no federal nexus, you're not required to come to us. Um, we do see a lot of projects where folks are just doing their due diligence. They want our input. They want to do the right thing. And we, we encourage that. So I'm gonna tell you how you can request um, a technical assistance um, review from my office. So up until a couple of years ago, um, we would just have you email us directly with your project information um, and that would start the whole review process. Um, things have changed. We now have a, um, the IPAC system, the Information for Planning and Consultation system, where before you come to us, you need to go in here. Um, and if you've never been in the IPAC system before, you'll have to create an, um, an account, it's not hard. It's, it's an easy thing to do. And then once you're in there, you're in. And you could go in, log in, um, and start your um, request for an official species list. And once you, I know I just skimmed through that, but it's really something you'll you'll need to take a look at. Um, and if some of you may, may have done this already, you, you may have submitted things to us and gone into IPAC and gotten an official species list. You basically go in there, you describe your project, um, you say where it is, um, and then you can hit request an official species list and it will tell you what species um, may occur in your project area. <clears throat> and on the top of that species list, you will have this um, uh, project code and that's unique to the project that you entered. The next step would be to move Marnie out of the way, um, you would email a technical assistance request to our general email inbox, ohio at fws.gov. Um, you would follow the instructions that, I'm not sure if Marnie has posted that for the group yet. Um, I did send her this um, handout in advance. It just tells you all the steps that you need to take to submit a technical assistance request to us. It's not hard. Again, it's it, the key to that is going in and getting that official species list first and sending that list or referring to that project code um, when you send your email to um, our email inbox. And when you submit something to Ohio at fws.gov, you're automatically going to receive um, an auto reply and it's going to have that handout on it. If you've submitted, everything that you, you know, you've submitted it properly with your project code, you can just consider that as your acknowledgement that we got your, your letter um, 
and you should receive um, a response letter from us within about 30 days. It can be a lot faster um, or it can be a little longer depending on um, you know, just the, the timing of, you know, some we get we get periods we go through where we just get a lot of projects and then we kind of have it slows down like around the holidays it slows down a little bit but it just depends on um, how many projects we receive but we're pretty good about getting those out within 30 days or less and in that letter it will have our conservation recommendations a lot of times it's going to say we recommend seasonal tree clearing um, these are our recommendations um, if there again if there's no section seven nexus there's no um, federal entity involved. Um, we do not have the ability to require you to do these things. They are our recommendations. Um, we're providing them at your request. And um, our, our uh, intent is to provide you with guidance on how we think you can avoid all ad adverse effects to federally listed bats and other species, generally bats, um, because they, they do occur statewide. Um, and oh, I'll point that out. If the project has a federal nexus and you have a response letter from us, you'll want to include that response letter um, in your submission to the federal agency. Again, I use the core as an example because we, we see a lot of core projects. So when you submit an application for a permit to the core, you'll, you'll want to submit our letter with that so they know you've already talked to us and what our recommendations are. That can really expedite the section seven process. So it really comes down to three things. Um, you want to avoid effects if you can. If you can't avoid all effects to bats, you want to minimize them as much as possible using um, things like seasonal tree clearing, um, reducing the, um, the area, um, sorry, um, minimizing, I, Consider, like I said, leaving leaving snags, leaving larger trees. Um, but then, if you can't minimize all potential adverse effects to bats, um, that's where um, we may we may ask you to mitigate. For we cannot require you to mitigate um, unless you are applying for a Section Ten A One B permit. That's a permit for um, incidental take, which means um, something's going to cause take of a listed species. Um, take is prohibited under Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act, but there are mechanisms for getting take exemptions, and one of them is an incidental take permit, but you can only get that if you um, do a habitat conservation plan. And generally, these are done for very large projects. Um, we do these for wind projects where they're putting up a lot of turbines um, that um, inevitably um, there will be bat strikes. Um, we we um, generally do not do habitat conservation plans for small scale projects. It, it's just too, it's too big of a lift. Um, but um, so, uh, mitigation, we, we don't require it unless there's that habitat conservation plan. But there are ways, if you want to do good things for bats, if you want to help offset um, a potential impact, uh, there are several bat mitigation, literally um, banks or options that you can um, use to offset impacts. Um, there's the Claremont County Conservation Bank, this was really set up um, primarily for those large scale HCPs that are being done for wind power where they have to mitigate so they can buy credits um, into this um, conservation bank. But there's also a service area for this that involves habitat loss, but it's really only for the Eastern um, and Southern um, counties in Ohio where that would apply. And then there's also this um, in lieu fee program that's been set up by the Conservation Fund, and that covers the Northern Long Ear Bat and Indiana Bat um, anywhere range wide, um, where uh, uh, you can you can pay into a um, uh, pay a fee basically to um, to help offset um, negative impacts for bats. 
and the main thing I just want to point out is Fish and Wildlife Service, we're always there to provide some guidance um, upon request. Um, we're, not, we're not going out, we're not banging on people's doors and say, hey, what are you doing? Um, we're not doing that. We are here to help you um, and, and help you be in compliance with the Endangered Species Act, whether you're um, you know, a, a big project sponsor or just a private landowner who wants to do um, some work in your, um, in your forest stand. Um, we're happy to um, provide some um, some recommendations on um, how we uh, and how you can help to conserve the bats, but helping get, get your project move forward. So um, that's the main message. Um, we don't have the authority to stop you from doing anything, um, but we certainly want want to help guide you to do it in the best way possible um, for bats. So with that. That is the end of my slideshow. Thank you so much, Angie. It was great. You're okay, Eileen, you're up. And before she gets started, as she's getting her uh, presentation loaded, um, since we're at 1137, lots of great information shared. In case we don't have as much time, which we probably won't for questions, I've started answering some of your questions mm -hmm. already. So you can go in there and look at the answers. Um, as we go along, I imagine we'll still have some at the end, but I'm trying to knock some of them out before then. So Eileen, thanks and take it away. All right, I hope I'm not muted. <laughs> um, so good. Uh, good. Um, so thanks everybody for sticking around for the last part of the talk. I'm gonna scale back just a little bit um, and talk less about actual forest management and a little bit more about what you can do to help bats or research with bats in Ohio, even if you don't have forests or, or you do and you're doing all this other work and you'd like to get a little bit more involved. Um, I'm going to talk about some opportunities and just provide some state updates as well for anybody who's taken an interest um, or has bats on their property, what might be interesting um, and relevant to you. So Marnie and Angie have both talked a lot about how bats are uh, and forests go hand in hand and forests are extremely important for bats. Um, but like I said, there's, there's plenty of other things that you can do to protect these species, to be a good steward for bats. And, and, um, and there's lots of opportunity here in the state. So the Division of Wildlife who I work with um, has several different volunteer opportunities that anyone can partake in. You don't need to have a forest. You don't need to have acreage. Um, these are the types of things that literally anybody could do. Um, so the first project, uh, volunteer-led project that we take part in are annual acoustic surveys. Um, what this involves is volunteers um, who, if you are in, if you end up you're interested in one of these volunteer programs, my email will be at the end of this presentation. So you'll feel free to reach out to me if any of these are of interest to you. Um, but with that, the, the, first, the first volunteer opportunity are these acoustic surveys. And for our volunteers, the Division of Wildlife provides a box of all the equipment you will need. So you don't need to go out and buy any of this yourself. Um, you will attach these acoustic device uh, microphones to the hoods of your car and you drive a predetermined route twice um, between June and July. So each summer we got about six months or eight months before the next round happens. Plenty of time to think about it. Um, so volunteers run these twice in the summer and the protocols, I'm not gonna get into all the nitty gritty of that, but the way we design these routes and the timing and all of that, is to partner with this really amazing North America North American Bat Monitoring Program, or what I'll refer to if I mention again is NABAT. And what NABAT does is it collects data from all over North America, not just Ohio, not even just the United States. And they're collecting data for summer populations as well as winter populations. Uh, roost tree locations, all kinds of things to get at what the region-wide population trends for these species are. 
like Marnie and Angie had shown you some maps about their ranges and these really, um, really incredible population declines across their range. A lot of these bats used to occur through a lot of North America and, and maybe they still do just at really low population numbers. Um, but NA bats a great resource for documenting how these populations are shifting throughout their entire range. So Ohio joined this several years ago um, and we're basically, you know, signing into being a part of this larger landscape and not looking at Ohio as an isolated bubble of bats. We're part of a big picture. So we, we put our data in this um, and, and we are now part of this, this range-wide population monitoring. Another volunteer opportunity um, for anybody, so you don't have to have a bat house or a bat roost on your property, but if you're interested, um, we have a volunteer program for monitoring bat roosts, and volunteers for this program will observe a roost, artificial roost, so this does not include if you're lucky enough to know where a maternity roost tree is, um, but if you know of a bat house, if you have a bat house or bat condo, if you have a metro park, for example, that you like to walk around at and those that place has bat roost, that's also perfectly fine. Um, you can volunteer to observe those roosts twice during the summer, so when bats will be using them, and you just hang out at, sunlight, at sunset and wait for the bats to start coming out. You count how many you see, you take a little bit of like temperature data, that sort of thing, and you send that information to the Division of Wildlife. Um, and this is still an active program. It's it's not, if you look it up online, it's not incredibly easy to get information on because we're in the process of revamping this a little bit um, and turning it into something where we could do like statistical robust scientific analyses on it. Um, but we're still happy to have people do it. More information is better than no information. So if this is something you're interested in doing, I have the link to the PDF here on this slide. Feel free to take a screenshot while I'm talking to you about it. It, it tells you what the protocol is. It has the data sheets right there. Um, so you don't even need to email me if you're signing up for it. You can just send me this data next summer if you happen to want to do this. So those are the two major volunteer opportunities that we have from the state side. But um, as Marnie had mentioned, I, I want to talk a little bit too about bats using buildings because this is another cross section where humans and bats may interact with each other. And in some ways that can cause conflict um, and it's per perfectly reasonable for people to not want bats in their attic or in their living space. So we want to get out a spread awareness about how the state um, treats bats and buildings, how um, the importance of stewardship for bats and structures that you may have on your property, including your attic sometimes, um, want to make sure that we're, you know, spreading awareness as much as we can. So um, just for a little bit of background information, it's been mentioned a few times, but some endangered bat species have been seen in artificial structures. Uh, the state endangered little brown bat is one of them that commonly uses structures. And we have in fact found some quite large maternity colonies using buildings. Um, one was discovered last year that has over a thousand female uh, little brown bats in them. Um, and that that's one of those incredible, um, uh, perhaps an outlier of what might be around the state, but it does happen. Um, and because bats are um, not particularly easy to identify when you saw all those pictures and Marnie was going through the different species, um, we as the state of Ohio do not expect you to be able to tell what kind of bat you have in your house. And so we assume that any bat in your building or in your barn is an endangered species. We treat all bats in buildings as if they were endangered, just to make it easier on everybody involved that you don't need to have a bat in hand to tell what it is. Um, so that has some relevance for the next few slides, but I just wanted to put that out there that we don't expect people to know what, what exact bats you have 
if you do have them in your artificial structures. One way you can figure out what kind of bats you have in your structure is to partake in this new project that kicked off this year. Um, this is a partnership between the Division of Wildlife and Joe Johnson's lab, and he's at the University of Cincinnati. Um, but he's got several graduate students who, if you, if you know you have bats, in your house or in your barn or, or some kind of structure on your building, um, and you want to know more about those bats, you can reach out to this email below. It's bats at uc.edu. So hopefully pretty easy to remember. And they will come to, they'll at least talk to you, see if you have photos to offer, um, get some information from you, and they will make a site visit to come identify what kinds of bats you have in, in your structure. And I want to be clear, this is not an exclusionary type service. Um, this is not a means to like get information in order to get rid of bats in your buildings. But if you have a population of bats in your barn that you like having around because they eat all your mosquitoes or you, you want to keep them there, this might be a great opportunity for you to find out what you have. And if it turns out that you have a state endangered bat on your property, um, that's great news, especially if you want to keep them around. Um, but you can reach out then to the state and we can try to provide you with some resources or at least in some information on how best to take care of that really sensitive population that you have. So feel free to email this if, if you're interested in it. I know that they've already visited 75 locations this year. And at least one of those is almost certainly a little brown bat colony. So they're already finding some positives for uh, endangered species using this project. But um, beyond the, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap up. The, those are the three types of citizen science projects we have in the state. Um, I know we're short on time and I wanna have people have time to ask some questions. So I'll jump really quick into some of the things to be on the lookout for, for the state of Ohio. There's a few changes coming into play, um, not related to the federal changes for the little brown bat or tricolored bat. That's the, that's the other thing that uh, Angie already covered. Um, but the state of Ohio has a few changes happening in uh, 2024 as well. The big one is the uh, the rule change that just happened for bad exclusion. And um, if anybody's had a bad exclusion done on their property before, on, and you have visited the ODNR, Ohio Department of Natural Resources website, the way it used to work is that if you had 15 or more bats in your building, um, you, you, it required you to have a permit if you wanted to do an exclusion from May 16th through July 31st. And that is related to that, that pup having season. So when these babies are born and they can't fly, we don't want to cause a situation where the babies are stuck in a building and the mother flies away and cannot get back into the, back into those babies that can't fly out. So that's what the original protections were for. Um, just recently, we've passed this rule um, and this reduces the number of bats required um, to have a permit to do an exclusion during that time of year. So the number used to be 15 um, and now it's five. If you have five or more bats during the summer that you need or want to have excluded, it, you must get a permit from the Ohio Division of Wildlife before doing that work. And this rule change also adds the, the fall and or winter months um, as a restricted period as well. So it, it's not in effect right now, um, but come 2024, starting October 15th, if there are any bats in your, in your house or in your building, you will need a permit to have those bats excluded. And that's really to protect um, bats from, from winter exposure. So um, to back up just a little bit, the, the summer exclusion, reducing that number of bats from 15 down to five is trying to protect the smaller colonies that may still exist. Um, you've seen some graphs and, and seen some, some data showing just how much 
population decline there's been where it's less than 1% of the time you're seeing these bats on the landscape. So we can no longer assume that these maternity colonies are, are staying at that 15 or more number. That, that was a number we had best at the time, but we don't know if that's relevant for this really sharp decline in populations. So we're trying to protect any smaller maternity colonies that may still exist. And we're adding those, those winter restrictions from October through March to protect hibernating bats from exposure. So we don't want a situation where we're excluding a bat, it wakes up during an unusually warm day in December and leaves your attic, but it finds that it can't get back in when the night gets cold and then it, it has nowhere to go before it becomes freezing again and that bat will die from exposure. So at this point, every bat counts. Um, the populations are so low now that we want to protect every bat we can and, and reduce um, even accidental take. Um, so that's what what the reason behind these this rule change is. Um, however, I want to be clear that we do acknowledge health and safety concerns. So this permit is not there to basically say no work can ever get done during these times. Um, we acknowledge that that there is a safety concern sometimes with bats being present. So there are exceptions for if a bat bite occurred, those bats can be removed immediately. Um, and we acknowledge that, you know, just uh, guano the, and there are some, there's some health concerns around their feces and, and just in interacting with pets and those sorts of things. Um, so we acknowledge that. Um, and those are the types of situations where permits do get do get sent out. And we will respond within a few days of the um, application being sent to us. So the, the rule change, um, I think the number is 10 days, but realistically we get a response out to you within one to two days. So we're pretty quick to turn around and make sure that you have the information that you need to go forward with any bats in your, in your structure. And this rule change will go into effect starting January 1st. So it's not in effect right now. I know um, come next year in October, it will be in effect. But right now, up until January, um, you know, the rule hasn't been in effect. I do implore you not to do any exclusions right now, even though the rule change hasn't gone in effect, because we are getting nights dipping into the into freezing now. Um, so if you can wait, that that is the best. Um, but but legally, this rule doesn't go in effect until January. And finally, just wanted to put everyone on notice um, that we do have a bat conservation plan in Ohio. It is it was first published in 2018. Uh, the link for it is on this slide, and it was developed in partnership with the Division of Wildlife and bat experts from organizations all over the state. So Marnie is a member with OSU. We have Nature Conservancy and Metro Parks and, and Forestry and all kinds of organizations involved in the writing and, and uh, reviewing of this conservation plan. And we're now in the process of doing a five-year review. So um, if, if all goes well, the, revi the revised new version will be up on that link um, and on the ODNR website in 2024. So this is just a great um, resource for anybody who wants to get involved in bat work. Um, it prioritizes where our needs are for conserving these species, as well as just it goes into detail about the importance of different habitat types like forests and the roles those play in bat conservation. So a great, uh, pretty short document to have uh, and, and flip through if you're interested. So um, like I said, here's my email. If you have any interest in volunteer opportunities or just have questions about the exclusion process, because I know I, I went through it really quick, um, feel free to reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to talk with you about your specific circumstances or, or some concerns that you have. And with that, I will stop and hopefully there's still time for a few questions. Thanks, Eileen. Awesome. All right. Um, so we do have some questions. Kathy, you might have a really short job duty this time. <laughs> Try to answer a lot of them, but I wanted to make sure that we could get to most of them before our time um, runs out. Um, so let me kind of scroll through here um, and try to hit 
some key ones. Uh, Carolyn asked, would bats use a bird bath as a water source? So um, I think that's probably too small. Um, and I kind of went looking for like how big of an area bats might need. And I found one publication, it was from out west, but it said that they need services at least 10 feet long and no less than 2.5 feet, feet wide. But Eileen, Angie, I don't know if you have any other experience with that and how big of an area bats really need. I still think a bat or a bird maybe, bath. Peter maybe a small. large bird bath, but just like us. And, and it would need to be in the open. So they need to be able yeah. to, so bats don't land and drink. They're, they're flying in, they're swooping through and then fly away. So they need to have a landing or a, a approach and a, a departure place to get to. So a, a bird bath, like in a fairly covered backyard is definitely not going to work. But if you have a large bird bath out in the open, maybe, you know, if it's desperate and there's no other water, maybe it would work, but probably not a, a, a pri primary source of water for bats would be my answer to that. And remember bats forage over such a large space, you know, it's not too terribly hard for them to find a more appropriate water space in that large foraging area that they use. Um, th they will use, you know, road ruts that have water to fly down a rut, you know, there's water in a, a road rut, they will fly down, drink. That's not unusual. Okay. Um, William asks, he said, open-sided storage buildings, bats are staying in the roof ridge board opening and return and stay there all summer for all summer long for many, many years. How can I get them to find another habitat? That's a really hard question. And it's a question we get a lot. Um, when a bat has found its way into a building that is particularly not your house, um, it can be really hard to convince them to go somewhere else. They're there for a reason. And if they come back every year, they're there for even more of a reason. Um, so you can try to install bat houses. Um, you can try to do some type of exclusion during the unrestricted periods to dissuade them from going. But for large buildings, um, it can be really hard to get them out. Bats, bats can get fit into any space that's the, the size of a dime. So they can fit in a real small spaces. It could take several years. It can get really expensive. Um, I will say there, so there are experts you can contact um, that will do a consultation, like look at your property and or your building and tell you about what it would cost. Um, that list of people allowed to do that is on the ODNR website. If you Google ODNR bats, you can find the permitted list. Um, so they'll come out and look. Um, they can get costly, but you are allowed to do the work on your own. So that is something um, you can do. I recommend reaching out to me if you are trying to get bats out of your building. I can have a chat with you, talk about your specific circumstance and, and kind of provide some guidance on what might be most financially reasonable and feasible for, for you. Okay. So Robert asks, is there a swab test for white nose syndrome in caves or structures? There is. Um, I don't know that it's like publicly available <laughs> for everybody, but um, that is one of the ways that scientists are monitoring um, white nose syndrome is by doing swabs and testing them. It, it's still a difficult process. I think they have, there's still ongoing research on whether those tests are providing false positives or false negatives, but it does exist um, in terms of like for a private property. I think, and Angie and Marnie, you could correct me if I wrong, I'm wrong. I think the assumption is that basically every bat has some level of white nose syndrome in the winter. Um, and usually by summer, it sloughs off because white nose, the fungus does not survive in summer temperatures. Um, but we just presume it's everywhere on, on every bat at this point, at least through the Division of Wildlife. Okay. Um, we're right at noon. How about one more? Um, how much of bat loss is due to loss of insects. It used to be that driving in the evening caused my windshield to be covered with insects I hit, but now I can't remember when that last happened. That's that's a tough question to really have an answer to. Um, we certainly believe that reductions in insects do have an impact on bats, especially um, when insects are being wiped out by pesticides. 
um, climate change, things are, you know, things are just really um, changing. It's, we, we know that there is some effect, the magnitude of which is really hard to measure. Um, but yeah, it's definitely of concern, um, especially um, around agricultural areas. Um, if large, you know, we're not getting the larger swarms of insects because of pesticides, that is concerning. Um, at the same time, there are a lot fewer bats on the landscape now. Um, so to the, to the extent that it's, it's um, causing the loss of bats, I, I don't know. Um, certainly it's not helpful to bats that are already declining. Um, that's probably the best I can answer that question. Okay, so Marnie, stop recording and I'll put the continuing ed link up.